Strange Wills. Stories of Strange Wills made by strange people. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William and featuring Perry Ward, Lorene Tuttle, and an all star Hollywood cast with the original music of Del Castillo. I devise and bequeath to my heirs the seven deadly sins envy, pride, hate, jealousy, despair, greed, and anger. And here is Warren William. These are the stories of strange wills made under the strangest of circumstances, and very often by exceedingly strange people. Human emotions run rampant through the pages of their last written declarations, as though knowing that the grim reaper is waiting patiently at their sides. They, in a final outburst, fling the challenge of death into the face of uncertain destiny. You'll see what I mean a little later, but first, a few words from your announcer. Back to Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in The Lady and the Pirate. It has been my good fortune to come from an illustrious line of lawyers. My inherited legal birthright dates back to the year 1724, when my ancestor and namesake, John Francis O'Connell, left England under the king's command to become the legal counselor to the governor of the Carolinas. But he had another mission, a secret one. He was sent to the Carolinas to personally direct in the capture and hanging of the notorious pirate and renegade Englishman, Black Richard Templeton, whose ship, the Elizabeth, cast a shadow of death and doom across the trade lanes in Caribbean waters. How Black Richard finally died is of no relative importance, but his will, written under the most peculiar of circumstances, remains as one of the most unique ever to be filed in probate. Let us now turn back the pages of history to a May evening in the year 1724. His gracious majesty's ship, the Royal Vengeance, bound for the Carolinas and the New World, is moving slowly down the channel toward the open sea. Only three passengers are aboard. The charming and beautiful Lady Ruth Carroll, whose husband died while fighting in his majesty's service against France. Her personal maid, Cecile, and I, John Francis O'Connell, barrister and personal representative of the king. The Lady Carol and her maid are leaning against the rail as they watch the slow progress of the ship as it passes the shadowy docks and buildings that line the waterfront. Weeks and months ahead lies the new world. Uncertainty, adventure, but we Britishers are an adventurous race. Well, Cecile, we're off at last at our great adventure. I wonder, my lady, if we'll ever see our beloved England again. I hope that divine providence will help us reach your uncle's plantation safely. Divine providence in our fearless ship, Cecile. Are you still afraid, little chipmunk? Haven't I told you the royal vengeance crowds more sail, carries more guns, and is manned by the bravest crew in all England? Yes, my lady Ruth, but, but... But what, Cecile? I know all that to be true, but I worry nonetheless. I've heard tales, tales from seafaring men. I've heard them tell of... Oh. oh, but I shouldn't frighten you, me lady. Oh, frighten me. <laughs> Goodness, Cecile, nothing ever frightens me. Go on. I've heard them tell of, of well, uh, about that pirate, Black Richard, they call him. 
And if their stories are true, his deeds are blacker than his name. He sounds exciting, Cecilia. Oh, how I would love to cross the path of this Black Richard. Me lady. I mean every word I say. I'm not afraid of any man. To show this lout up in his stupidity would be my greatest delight. Ah, but if he sees you, if Black Richard should ever see you... <laughs> well, let him. He'll see how high an English girl can toss her chin. He'll see that I'm no scullery maid to be trifled with. Oh, me lady, I'm afraid he'll see more than that. Oh, what do you mean? He'll see two red lips bursting with ripeness. He'll see blue eyes as soft as a summer cloud <laughs> and a figure that was the toast of London. And seeing, what do you think he will do, Sophia? I'd rather not say, me lady. <laughs> A good ship, the Royal Vengeance, sailed on toward the New World. The weather was brisk. The wind filled every ounce of sail she carried. In less than six weeks, she'd put in at the Canaries for supplies and then sailed on. Would the crossing be made without misadventure? Without sighting Black Richard? It was inevitable that Lady Ruth Carroll and I should become good friends. It was inevitable, too, that we should discuss what was on everyone's tongue and mind, Black Richard. Late one evening at dinner, If what you say of him is true, Mr. O'Connell, you have good reason to be practicing with the cutlass. My heavens, he'll make a swordsman of you yet. <laughs> and that he has, my lady. Most of my waking hours have been devoted to the deadly art of the cutlass. And I must confess, <laughs> I've even practiced in my sleep. <laughs> Just let me see Black Richard, and I promise you, my lady, he'll be carrying fit for the buzzer. In spite of all your <laughs> horrible stories about making the men walk the plank and taking the women to his lonely isle near Nassau. I'm still not the least bit afraid. Ha, <laughs> ha, brave girl. And you've really no reason to be. The Royal Vengeance carries 60 guns, and each gun crew has been trained by the Royal Navy. Our gallant Captain Hughes is considered the bravest, most fearless master on the high seas. No, this Black Richard won't tackle us this crossing. Oh, fiddlesticks, I'm disappointed. No, uh, don't be, my lady. Consider yourself fortunate. As our ship drew near the Bahamas, the first ill omen appeared. The barometer fell rapidly. The Royal Vengeance was running head on into a storm, and the wind, reaching hurricane velocity, was driving us nearer and nearer to the lair of Black Richard. Captain Hughes was prepared for the storm. Up the main top, Master! Hurry! Keep your eyes open for strange ships! Aye, aye, sir. Batten down the hatches. Gun crews on the alert. We can't be caught napping. Mr. O'Connell. Mr. O'Connell. Aye, Captain. You'll take the ladies below for their personal safety and yours. We're going to have dirty weather. My lady. Cecile, you heard we're ordered below. Oh, isn't this storm wonderful? Look at the waves. Oh, sheer mountain. And the wind, how it howls. Like the very devil, if you ask me. Just think, Mr. O'Connor. Somewhere out there in the same storm is Black Richard. I wonder what he's doing. More than likely heading straight for port. I doubt if he enjoys this any more than we do. I heard a sailor say that this is Black Richard's weather. That when the storm is at its worst, he ties himself to the topmast with his spyglass and he looks for ships. And then he follows them in the storm. That's utter and... nonsense. No man in his right mind. We'd better go below before the captain puts us in chains. Well, at least in the cabin we won't be able to hear the wind. Hold on the rope, Cecile, and you too, my lady. Or you'll likely be blown right off the ship. That's right. Easy now. There we are. Now down the steps. Rest if you can, Lady Ruth. I'll go on deck. If anything unusual happens, rest assured I'll come back and tell you. The only thing unusual that's going to happen is that... I'm getting a funny feeling in my stomach. Oh, why did I ever leave England? I'll never know. I'll never know. Oh, forgive me, my lady. Mr. O'Connell, but I think I'm going to die. All that night the storm raged on in unabated fury. The passengers and crew, with few exceptions, became violently ill. Sleep was out of the question. It became a matter of personal survival against the elements. 
With the first leaden signs of dawn, the wind abated. I staggered out of my cabin and walked up to the deck. Just as I reached it, I heard a cry from the direction of the topmast. Sail! The sail to starboard! Man the guns! Clear the deck! Describe the ship! Lieutenant, send a shot across the bow. Head will stop her until we can send over a boarding party to examine her papers. She's coming on under full sail. Wait, sir. She's lowering her flag. It's coming down. It... She's sending up another. I catch it. Wait. Yes. Yes, it's the Jolly Roger. The skull and the crossbones. She's a pirate ship, the Elizabeth. The pirate ship, the Elizabeth. <laughs> On board, things were in bad shape. The men weakened from the storm were in no condition to repel a serious attack. On and on came Black Richard's ship, and then, when we were in cannon range... All hands on deck to repel the attack! Stand by for action! Chop away the broken mast and clear the debris! Gun crews, break her fore and aft! Be alive there! Mr. O'Connell, you'll go below and assist Lady Carroll and her mate to escape should we found her to be taken. But, Captain... That's an order, Mr. O'Connell. Aye, sir. And God save the royal vengeance. Yes, Mr. O'Connell. God save the royal vengeance. Even as I went below deck with Lady Ruth and Cecile, I was formulating a plan of action. I had been sent to the Carolinas under the king's command to assist in the capture and hanging of Black Richard the pirate, and I would do just that no matter what the captain ordered. But first, I must allow for the safety of Lady Ruth and Cecile. Oh, Mr. O'Connell, Lady Ruth, listen. I hear the sound of cutlasses. The pirates have boarded the ship. Mr. O'Connell, I'm afraid. Mr. O'Connell, I'm so afraid. Uh, Quiet, Cecile. Now listen carefully, both of you. I want you to do exactly as I say, or your life may be forfeited. Lady Ruth, get into a serving gown immediately. But... uh, but... There's no time for buts. If you are taken prisoner, tell them that you are both scullery maids, sailing in bondage to the colonies. All of your fineries, everything, must be cast into the sea. Not a trace. Oh, I knew I never should have left London. Just think Black Richard will capture us and carry us off to his island. We'll all be slaves to those filthy pirates. I'm going back on deck to engage Black Richard. I'll try to come back if matters worsen, but heed me. If you hear the sound of battle turning against us, you are to jump out of your window into the sea. That's an order. Tell the great barrister would have us cast ourselves into the sea. Death before dishonor and all that belly rock. I say, get me a cutlass. I'll fight You'll do as you, as I say, young lady. But I can't swim. I can't. Quiet, both of you. As you can see, the water is covered with debris from the battle. If necessary, hang on to anything within reach and trust to God's providence. On deck, matters were serious. The pirates, led by that merciless creature, Black Richard, were driving the king's men backward steadily. I looked for Black Richard, but in the heat of the battle, I could not find him. However, I soon found myself engaged in a furious combat with one of his cutthroats. Hell, blow me down if I ain't found me a dandy. <laughs> Lace, frills, and silver buckles. <laughs> there for all the frills. You found a man who'll soon carve the heart out of your, your worthless carcass. <laughs> Listen to them pretty words. Why, you fancy pants, I'll slice your gizzard to ribbons. To that, I take oath. There, there, you friggin'. Taste the king's seal. Rally, men! Rally round the king's standard! Part two of Strange Wills follows in just a moment. Thank you.
Now back to The Lady and the Pirate and Warren William. The battle raged on. I saw our gallant captain fall, slashed by a dozen cutlasses. And then through the melee, I saw the man I'd sworn to capture and hang. There he was, Black Richard, brandishing his heavy cutlass now red with blood. I challenged him. Black Richard Templeton, surrender in the name of the king. You ask Black Richard to surrender? Ha, 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 ha! Look around you, lads. You have not a handful left alive. As long as I'm alive, I intend to run you through. Why, you young pipsqueak, I'll slice the ears off your curly black head. That I promise by the beard of Beelzebub. Ha! <laughs> your faith is not so haughty now, Black Richard. Your eyes are blinded by your foul blood. Uh, I got him. I got him, Black Richard. Crashed him right into the sea with a belay and pin I did. Oh. oh, Captain, your face is based in a bit. Here, Captain, sit down when I finish off the rest of this high-born scum. It'll only take a blooming minute. My unexpected fall into the water revived me almost immediately. Looking up at the ship, I saw that I had fallen close alongside Lady Ruth's cabin. Cecile was at the window, looking frantically down at me. Hurry, Mr. O'Connell, hurry! The pirates have come below. Go first, Cecile. Hurry, Chipmunk. I'll get my jewels. Open up in there. Open up or I'll carve the heart out of your body. Here I come, Mr. O'Connell. All right, Cecile. Quickly now. Ruth. Ruth, where are you? Hurry. Hurry. Ah! <laughs> well, shiver my timbers. Look what I captured. <laughs> Cecile and I, clinging to our spar, watched the royal vengeance break out in angry flames and then, like a tired warrior, slowly sink into a foaming sea. In the far distance, we could see the pirate ship Elizabeth settle slowly by the bow. It had been a death struggle. But fate was kind. The very next morning, a British man of war sighted us adrift and saved our lives. Eventually, Cecile and I reached the Carolinas. But the weeks passed, and nothing more was heard about the gallant crew and the royal vengeance, or from Lady Ruth. Strangely, too, nothing more was heard from Black Richard. He had disappeared just as mysteriously as the rest. What had happened? I was sitting in my chambers one afternoon, almost two years later. There's a lady to see you, sir. She says you will recollect. Her name is Carol, a Lady Ruth Carol. What? Lady Ruth Carroll? Oh, I can't believe it. You. You, Lady Ruth, I... Your obedient servant, sir. May I enter? Oh, by all means. But you must be a ghost. I simply can't believe that you're alive. Here, here, sit down. Thank you. I had great adventure, Mr. O'Connell. I've lived and I've learned. I'm not the same girl you once knew. That night, Lady Ruth and I had a quiet supper. I didn't want to seem impatient, but inwardly I was seething with unanswered questions. And then... I know you want to hear about the rest of the story, Mr. O'Connell. As you know, the door of my cabin was broken down just as Cecile escaped through the window. As the door crashed, I turned and looked at my... my captor. He grabbed me around the waist and carried me on deck to where the pirate captain, Black Richard, was lying with his head and eyes swathed in a bloody bandage. 
I stood alongside Black Richard and I looked down at him. As soon as he spoke, I knew he was no ordinary pirate. I'm sorry I can't receive you more appropriately, lass, but as you see, I... I see that you are sorely wounded, sire. Who are you, lass? I... I'm a scullery maid in bondage to the colonies. A scullery maid? <laughs> you think me a fool? You do not believe me? Once, long, long ago, I knew ladies such as you. You are highborn. Who are you? Come, come, out with it. I'm only an English girl, proud of her heritage and her race. Well said. Well spoken. That is my misfortune. I can't see you. Not for the present, at least. And please don't try. I'm nothing much, I assure you. Come now, I will change your bandages, and then we must leave this ship. Your cannon have set it afire. Morris! Morris, the vast there! Aye, Captain. I be here. Are all off? All, all off, sir. All but us three. I have the boat waiting. But hurry, Captain. The fighter is gaining. Now then, lass, we'll attend to my hurts. If you will pardon the use of my petticoats for bandages. <laughs> no man was ever luckier. First now, I'll take the bandage from your eyes. Here it comes. Why the gasp? Does the sight of blood frighten you? Oh, no. Oh, no, it isn't that. It... It is an ugly wound, I know. <laughs> not one for fair eyes like yours. It's not the wound, my... Forgive me. You must be in pain. The pains of the flesh are small. Much worse, I know that my fighting days are over. I know that... that I am blind. Is it not true, lass? Yes, sir, it is true. You are blind. The three of us set out in the small boat. By that time, the Elizabeth had sunk beneath the waves. During the night, we suffered our first casualty. Morris, the pirate who accompanied us, was washed into the sea. Finally, after I'd given up all hope, I sighted land. It turned out to be a small, uninhabited island. Our landing through the heavy surf was miraculous. Black Richard was greatly weakened through the loss of blood. I half carried, half dragged him up to the beach. He spoke to me weakly. So this is the finish for Black Richard, scourge of Britain. <laughs> it is well. It's only right that you know that for ten years I've been at war with my own beloved land, my own British Isle. I built a free country in the wilderness, one where there's no servitude, no bondage. But now, for me, it's over. Yes, over but for one last task. Lass, in England I was once a rich man. My fortune is still there. I'm alone, having neither wife nor child. Only a sister, God bless her memory. But she's wealthy in her own right. I need someone to bring the money back. Back here to my new country. If I die without a will, it will revert to the crown. Lass... If you could see the smiling faces of the people who live free of bondage... There's nothing I would rather see, Richard. And you shall, too. Because I'll tell you where my free land lies. But first, I must draw a will. You shall be the beneficiary. And I have your solemn word that the money will be turned over to my free colony. My solemn word, sire. I have naught but my dagger. Uh, help me to my knees, child. Yes, sir. I'm up. Now, lass, in the name of a free people, bear your back. I'm taking my dress off. I shall hurt you, child, mightily. I shall try not to scream. Hand me my dagger. Here, sire. Ready? Ready, sire. No! Black Richard died the next day. I buried him and marked his grave. A short while later, a passing ship rescued me. It was bound for free land, Black Richard's home. What I saw there confirmed everything he told me. Mr. O'Connell, I'm going back to England and to bring back Black Richard's fortune back to those people. And I shall join them in their new way of life. But, Lady Ruth, Black Richard has no standing before the British courts. Even if he had a fortune... If it became known, it would be confiscated by the Crown. Black Richard Templeton was a fictitious name, Mr. O'Connell. There is another name, a real name that he once bore honorably. 
No one shall know that there was any relationship between the two. Only you and I. But, Lady Ruth, I am the king's counselor. I have sworn allegiance to his majesty. But first I shall take you to visit the people of Freeland. And then you can make your own decision. My ultimate decision was clearly defined when I accompanied Lady Ruth Carroll back to London in order to help her in proving the last will and testament of Black Richard. We were summoned before the House of Peers. I presented her case. My lords, because of the mitigating circumstances which will be known to you, the last will and testament of the deceased can never be actually filed. But I have brought the sole beneficiary before this august body in order that each of you can personally examine the document. Lady Ruth Carroll, I ask you now to disrobe before the House of Peers. Oh, believe me, my lords, I do not show disrespect to either Lady Ruth Carroll or to you. Rest assured that only her back will be exposed. Are you ready, milady? Yes, Mr. O'Connell. Will you please walk up to the lords, milady, and let them examine your back? And with your permission, my lords, I shall read the words tattooed across her back. All to bearer. Signed, Sir George Pemberton, 1724. Many of you remember Sir George Pemberton. He sailed for the colonies ten years ago. Little was heard of him since, save only that he purchased an island in the Bahamas. But by fate or providence, as you will, Sir George Pemberton lived long enough to carve his last will and testament on the back of his own sister. Warren William will be back in just a moment to tell you what the official records say about the case of the Lady and the Pirate. But first, here is a brief message from your announcer. Now back to Warren William. In the last pages of his diary about this famous case, John Francis O'Connell says, By special decree, a copy of the last will and testament of Sir George Pemberton was permitted to be filed instead of the original. The reason, of course, was apparent. The diary continues. All of the monies of Sir Pemberton's estate were turned over to the beneficiary, and about six months later, Lady Carroll and I returned to free land forever. And here the diary ends. Was the black anger that Sir Pemberton bore against tyranny and oppression a deadly sin? It might have been. But there are those who think that this personal love of freedom and equality greatly outweighed the apparent injustices made during his life as a pirate. For who in this case can draw the line between pirate and liberator? I can't. Can you? Next week, my story is about a man who, in his last will and testament, bequeathed the one and only thing he held most dear in life to, of all people, his competitor. It was not money nor jewels, but much more important, the girl he loved and hoped to marry. Fortunately for all concerned, this will was never filed for probate. But you'll hear a story as beautiful, as poignant, and as realistic as any ever heard before. We call this unusual story The Prince of Broadway. This is Warren William inviting you to listen again next week. Strange Wills is written by Ken Crapine and directed by Albert Ulrich. This is a Tellaways feature produced in Hollywood. Hollywood.